Welcome to another Infographic Instant Conference presentation. In this presentation, we'll be talking about what makes a world-class international financial center, specifically using the example of Hong Kong and the solar panel industry. As we note in our report, we first outlined several plans for international financial centers. These plans target Mumbai, Dubai, even Hong Kong, Moscow, Istanbul, and New York. And the leitmotif running through all of these studies is that if these cities want to become preeminent international financial centers, they need to somehow make their banks and financial institutions somehow cheaper or more profitable. That regulation has to be less or better, or in some ways, rules have to target the way banks function. Yet, this advice diametrically opposes much of the research that has been conducted over the last 25 years on international financial centers. In our report, we illustrate some of the trends of the literature which show how to make an international financial center. We review approaches such as the social network approach, where international financial centers simply consist of networked individuals that span through social relationships across space and time. We show the comparative law and finance approach, whereas in many economists have done very fine work looking at the design of institutions to encourage people to use international financial centers endogenous growth models where an international financial center can continue on its relatively successful path by using its previous successes, as well as other approaches such as the institutionalism of capitalism approach, which basically looks at the conjunction of different markets such as labor, capital, competitors in the product market, and other aspects of the competitive environment. And of course, the school which this study is probably most based in, the legal school, that looks at the way regulations can be changed in order to promote the growth of an international financial center. After our review of the literature, we look at several of the factors that determine the growth of such international financial centers, such as clustering effects, distance effects, portfolio effects, complementarities between investors and international financial institutions, and so forth. And at the risk of oversimplifying our paper, the main message of our analysis is that financial institutions in these international financial centers need to focus on the productive ends of finance, namely the industries that these banks are giving money to, rather than the banks themselves. They also need to see these international financial centers as markets for information. One of the biggest values of an international financial center in modern days is its ability to aggregate information. And the view must turn away from seeing these international financial centers as means or looking at the means by which capital flows through them. Thus, looking at banks is the wrong approach. In order to start our analysis, we naturally look at the market size of a potential sector that an international financial center like Hong Kong could fund, namely the market size for solar panels and solar generated electricity. And what we see from this first infographic is we look at the value of sales and leases of solar panels across China as a potential market for lending and finance from Hong Kong. As the map of China shows, the western parts of China clearly receive more sunlight than the eastern parts. Thus, to some extent, as electricity flows from west to east, money has to flow from east to west in order to finance this solar equipment. Continuing our analysis, we note that the market size is much bigger for Hong Kong than simply the mainland. This shot of the Asia region at night shows roughly electricity consumption in lighting across the Asian region. And what we see is that some markets are very heavily served by existing electricity providers, particularly in India, to some extent the eastern seaboard of China, certainly Japan, certainly Taiwan. However, we see other markets that are much less provisioned. Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, even some parts of Malaysia. 
We might suspect that demand for a new industry, particularly one that generates electricity, would be higher in these areas where there are no viable alternatives or substitutes. Thus, the market size for the solar panel and photovoltaic industry, and particularly finance of that industry, extends well beyond the mainland. In order to add precision to our analysis, we show the discounted expected value of returns to solar investments in what we call Hong Kong's catchment area, namely those jurisdictions where Hong Kong financial institutions might seek out customers in order to provide them with finance of photovoltaic equipment. And what we see showing a log value of revenues is naturally China represents the largest market by far in terms of expected revenue from the photovoltaic industry, yet other major markets also promise to yield high revenues. The value of such revenues from Russia should come out at roughly 85 billion US dollars, India roughly 60 billion US, and even Thailand, Indonesia at roughly 1.3 billion dollars each. Thus, in terms of adding to our financial center's books of business, we see that these markets have very large potential. Thus, if Hong Kong wants to grow as an international financial center, it clearly has to find ways of providing finance to these jurisdictions and has to make itself more attractive than other international financial centers. And what is more, that we see that demand for photovoltaic equipment might extend even further into Asia after considering the way that Chinese companies will probably migrate into some of the lower cost Asian centers. This infographic shows the drivers of China's comparative advantage in producing a watt of electricity. And what we see is that China still maintains a reasonably large scale economy, which decreases costs. Of course, its cost of labor adds to its cost advantages. Yet we see that the most important capitalist aspects of this industry, namely the cost of debt and the cost of equity, hardly or not at all contribute to China's cost advantage. As mainland companies shift abroad, they will want to find new sources of debt and equity in order to keep their cost advantage beyond simply hiring cheaper and cheaper labor. Thus, we see that if we want to look at the future of Hong Kong as an international financial center, we have to start first with thinking about the size of a sunrise industry that it might fund. And in this case, the value of that sunrise industry could exceed well over half a trillion US dollars. Now, in order to understand the competitive advantage of an international financial center like Hong Kong, one has to understand the financial value chain, namely those steps that the international financial center uses to shift demand into supply. Figure 8 in our paper shows a stylized example of the photovoltaic cell manufacturing process and we have superimposed on that process the financial value chain, namely those aspects of finance which correspond to the various steps of the manufacturing or sales process. Thus, looking at that manufacturing process, we see that solar R&D companies and equipment manufacturers hold the stock of licensing or lease agreements, that intellectual property that's used to build solar panels, for example. We see that operations and maintenance companies have the responsibility for providing solar panels to potential consumers. We see that on a mass scale, particularly solar power providers at both the retail and wholesale level need to go out and market solar panels as well as find out where there is existing demand. Solar power utilities comprise their own segment. Namely, there could be so much demand for solar power as a utility rather than simply as a retail or wholesale individualistic good or service. Naturally, looking at the users of solar panel, one might consider both the direct and indirect users of photovoltaic equipment. Put on top of this manufacturing process, we see that there are different financial instruments that make each of these steps possible. Institutional investors, mutual funds to some extent provide those bundles of stocks and bonds that are used to finance this stock of intellectual property. 
Thus, on the one hand, you might see a pile or a stack of patents of intellectual property, and correspondingly, you might see a stack or pile of stocks and bonds. Naturally, speculators make use not only of institutional investors, but also asset-backed security consolidators, a business model which is increasingly important even in places like the U.S. And around this industry, a third-party credit market might emerge in order to provide additional finance directly on the demand side or user side of this market. And in terms of providing funding, retail investors should represent the bulk of the financial demand, just so much as households and companies should comprise the bulk of solar electric demand. Carrying on with this concept of solar electricity as a value chain, we see here the steps involved in a cross-border solar securitization. And what we see is that this securitization is simply a nexus of contracts which cuts up risks and returns. Any solar panel, for example, will have its own risks and returns. In terms of financing these solar panels, we see that returns might go to shareholders, bondholders, and other executives. We see that these stakeholders take on certain types of risk, such as management expropriation risk in the case of bondholders and shareholders. And we also see that all three groups take on China regulatory risk. Continuing further down the chain, we see that there are securitization originators, we see the wholesale market in these types of securities, as well as retail intermediation of these solar securities. And we see that along the securitization process, there are other risks which are chopped up and passed on to demanders of these financial products. If the securitized instrument is created in Hong Kong, there are naturally regulatory risks in Hong Kong. Amongst wholesalers and even retailers, they incur a certain amount of monitoring risk, risk of regulations in other jurisdictions where they sell the securities, counterpart risk of wholesalers to retailers of other business partners, the risk of not being able to get their money back in case a partner or customer goes bankrupt, the risk of imperfect hedging, as well as counterpart risk in the whole chain. Institutional economics is very comfortable with the idea of thinking about a corporation or indeed any productive process as simply a nexus of contracts as one agreement carrying on from another agreement to another agreement, which simply partitions returns and risks. And if we've seen the market size for the actual photovoltaic industry, figure nine shows the market size of financing for this industry. As we see in the figure, we've estimated the maximum market size for equity finance of common stock shares in these photovoltaic companies in the catchment region at roughly five billion US dollars. We see that demand for preferred shares rather than common shares comes to about 4 billion, senior debt at 2.5 billion, subordinated debt at 1.5, and so forth. You can see the original study for the procedures we use to derive these estimates. Interestingly though, we see that a relatively large part of this market consists of demand for securitized instruments. Namely, if Hong Kong is not able to provide these new cutting-edge instruments in a way that is safe for investors and other consumers to use, then investors will very well bypass Hong Kong entirely. Moreover, looking at figure 28 from the paper, we see that there is more than enough assets and liabilities on the mainland in these solar companies in order to create the types of securities we just talked about. This figure shows the value of assets of these photovoltaic companies, as well as the value of their liabilities. Thus, if we think about company value as the simple sum of assets and liabilities, we see that financiers in places like Hong Kong have the potential of chopping up these assets of bundling them in securities or debt contracts and sending those pieces of paper out not only across China but across the world and taking their own cut of the process.
This brings us to the economics of a financial center. In figure 17 from our paper, we show the funding gap for solar investment in several jurisdictions, as well as the cost of capital, which could be used to finance solar investment. Ideally, an international financial center would take a low cost of capital and deploy that capital in a place where there's a very high electricity cost. Thus, ideally, looking at the data in this figure, we see that places like Russia, India, and Brazil would choose to use financiers from places with the lowest cost of capital, i.e. the UK, Japan, the US, and much less Hong Kong and China in general. Naturally, there's a role for financial intermediation in that incomes across China do not match sunshine namely those areas that could most benefit from photovoltaic cells are not those same regions that have the incomes necessary for households and businesses to be putting up these photovoltaic cells on top of their homes and businesses. Thus, the solar industry is ripe for a financial intermediary who can bridge the mismatch between solar supply and finance, particularly in a market like China, where money is in the East and electricity is in the West. And as we saw before, the value of solar securities comes to billions and billions of US dollars. Yet, as we know from historical experience, risks and returns related to those securities can be partitioned. Remember, we talked about these nexus of contracts. They can be partitioned in tranches. Figure 33A shows one distribution of the value on these solar companies' balance sheets of assets and liabilities across the various tranches of a securitized instrument. Thus, we look at companies with credit ratings in the safest tranche. We show the current value of assets of those companies in millions of US dollars. And we compare that to the value of current assets held by low rated companies on the mainland. And we cannot say that the safe tranche is better in some ways than the risky tranche. Instead, we have to say that one provides a certain return for the risk it takes on, whereas in the other naturally does the same. Now we see that the market for solar securities is very large just simply by looking at the value of plant property and equipment. Taking away the potential revenue streams from the electricity itself, just looking at the value of those tangible assets held by these companies, we see that the value of PPE, plant property and equipment, easily comes to 7 billion US dollars. Moreover, if we calculate the return on assets of these companies, again sorting companies according to their credit ratings, we see that there's a significant market inefficiency in risks versus returns. Namely, the safest tranche of these companies earned a return of 13% if their plant property and equipment was bought in 2011 and sold in 2012, whereas in the riskiest tranche and the penultimate riskiest tranche end up having returns of 8 and 7% respectively. When we do not see a correspondence between risk and return in any market, there is the possibility of arbitrage and thus an opportunity for an international financial center like Hong Kong. If we step back and think about the economics of a financial center, we can see that intermediation as a value added drives a financial center's economics. Turning our attention now to the finance of a financial center rather than the economics of a financial center, Figure 20 shows the largest solar companies by market capitalization in Hong Kong relative to the US. And what we see is that Hong Kong has not suffered lack of demand of listing of solar companies. We show the market capitalization of large solar companies in black, those that are listed in Hong Kong, and in green, those that are listed in the US. And applying even the simplest statistical tests, we cannot see any kind of correlation between price to earnings ratios of companies listed in Hong Kong rather than the US. Thus, we cannot definitively say that listing in Hong Kong, for example, helps these companies increase their prices relative to earnings and thus do not necessarily make investments in these companies more profitable. 
This being said, investments in these companies naturally are very amenable to securitization or even listing on a stock exchange because we see that even a balance sheet item like receivables has significant variance not only in the value of these receivables but also in its correlation with the general Hong Kong Stock Exchange Index. Naturally, one of the most important uses of investments in securities like solar securities would be to hedge risks from the general market while at the same time receiving returns that are at that market level or higher. Anyone who studied basic finance knows that diversification and particularly finding shares that co-vary with each other represents one of the best ways of reducing portfolio risk can divide these receivables, which then might be packaged into securities, for categories, as we show, the low-risk accentuators, namely those companies whose price correlates heavily with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange Index, and thus might seem to actually bump up returns when times are good and bump down returns when times are bad. We see that some of the companies here at the bottom end up diversifying or correlating negatively with the general market, thus helping to lower portfolio risk. Whereas in we see for some of the higher risk solar companies that a larger proportion of them correlate positively with the overall market index, unsurprisingly. Yet there are some solar companies that seem to have high risks, but also hedge very well against these market risks. The point is not to say that some solar companies' shares are better than others, but simply to say that the market is certainly deep enough and varied enough to provide an equity for each type of investor. Figure 19 from our paper shows the changes in stock prices of some of China's solar companies. And what we see is that the risk of holding these shares, namely these shares betas, do not vary significantly from one exchange to the other. We see that some securities are traded much more than others, but except for these outliers, there's not a huge variance in terms of market demand for these securities. Indeed, one of the effects that we show in our paper is something called the California effect. And academics have noted that a financial center looking to provide money for the Sunrise Industries has to locate not too close to the industry, but also not too far from the industry. We take the example of the US-based Mosaic, which provides funding for photovoltaic investment. We see that there's a spread of investors that do not necessarily agglomerate next to their investments. And the benefit of this, naturally, is that they're not competing against very large financial institutions that oversupply the market with capital, but on the other hand, aren't so far away that it's very costly to put money into these companies. Thus, we see that places like Hong Kong might have a California effect for markets like mainland photovoltaic industry, yet it's clear if Hong Kong wants to beat out other financial centers in the longer run, it's going to need an alpha or a sigma, it's going to need returns or risk profiles that are different from other markets. We argue that in the case of Hong Kong, one way of creating this differentiation is to encourage investment in photovoltaic companies at home in Hong Kong, rather than Hong Kong simply acting as an entrepot, a middleman, an intermediary that simply funnels money from China abroad and vice versa. And we show this disparity between investment and trading in figure 13 for the company of Jinko. And we see that Hong Kong has the highest number of broker dealers dealing with Jinko securities. The UK has the least number of these broker dealers. Yet when we look at the stake held by local investors, we see that UK investors have the largest share of holdings in Jinko Solar Securities as opposed to Hong Kong investors share at only 3%. While it's true that these Hong Kong investors do not carry the risks associated with these Sunrise Industries, they also do not carry the potential returns. Furthermore, expanding our vision to the whole world, 
Figure 21 shows the demand on a city-by-city -city basis. And what we see is that Hong Kong does not represent the largest market by any stretch of the imagination for securities like Han Energy Solar, but instead the largest demand for these securities comes out of places like Paris, London, Chicago, San Francisco. Thus, we obviously do not see what might be considered a natural California effect from happening, but we see instead that places like New York have competitive advantage over a jurisdiction like Hong Kong, which in theory should be monopolizing this industry. If figure 21 shows this profile of investments for Han Energy Solo, then figure 12 shows this profile of investments for Jinko Solar. And we see a similar pattern, albeit with Hong Kong investors holding larger proportions of investments in this company. We nevertheless see that jurisdictions like Chicago, like London, San Francisco, they tend to monopolize investment in these solar companies, therefore exposing themselves to the potential returns from this sunrise industry. But what we would argue is that these jurisdictions not only centralize or agglomerate risks and returns, they also agglomerate competencies in investing in a sunrise industry like photovoltaic cells. Figure 24 shows the links between investment in several photovoltaic companies their institutional investors, as well as the banks that lend to them. And what we see is that there are four large aggregators of securities in these solar companies, yet these aggregators are mostly located in the US and not in Hong Kong or even Singapore for that matter. So to some extent, these American companies have intermediated themselves right in the middle of this intermediation chain, thereby cutting out jurisdictions like Hong Kong. Moreover, the simple diversity of investment centers in the solar industry suggests that Hong Kong has a very large amount of competition on its hands. Figure 22 shows the concentration of solar asset holdings, and again you can see our paper for more information on the methodology, but what we see is that investors in places like Singapore, Chicago, Hong Kong to be sure, and places like New York tend to have larger concentrations of solar assets. That means these jurisdictions will benefit from risks and returns, but more importantly, they will develop the market knowledge needed in order to invest and grow these companies in the future. If we've already shown that some jurisdictions like Chicago have their own large intermediaries in solar finance, then we see that Hong Kong lacks its own homegrown intermediaries. Figure 23 shows the percentages of shareholdings held or managed by major custodians in Hong Kong. Thus, if we read down the list of solar companies, we cannot see the actual investors in these shares, but we can see holdings of major custodians, those companies that purchase the shares on behalf of their investors. And what we see is that there's some limited specialization of investment, but we do not see any one institution dominating investment in these securities. Yet, if we break down these holdings and think about it in this structured, securitized way that we talked about before, we might be able to construct portfolios that are based on the proportional holdings of these custodians. For example, we see here on the right that different financial institutions hold different proportions of different solar companies. Thus, we see that some custodians specialize to a limited extent in companies like Hanergy, Comtech, whereas in few of them specialize in companies like SolarTech. Thus, we see that there's demand for some kinds of securities, less demand for others, We've seen that securities have different risks and return profiles. It is therefore quite conceivable that one could create a bundled instrument which invests in the entire solar market and distributes finance to the industry as a whole 
figure 25 shows holdings in a hypothetical Bauhinia solar fund that Hong Kong intermediaries might put in place in order to aggregate investment and thus centralize knowledge in investing in this sunrise industry. Now, if we take holdings of these financial intermediaries, the holdings that you've already seen in the previous slide, and if we simply give shares to these institutional investors based on what they hold right now, we see that shares in this Bahinia Solar Fund would go largely to companies like Chief Securities, Shanghai Commercial Bank, Bank of East Asia, and we see that other intermediaries would have a much smaller share in this solar fund, such as Hantech Securities, Bank of China, and so forth. Thus, there is absolutely a potential market for aggregation of financial products in this market. Yet, these types of products will not come into existence on their own. There has to be a force which encourages their creation, and we argue in our paper that the financial center itself is a technology for creating an organization necessary to make these investments. And even more importantly, the law in that center is critical to providing the incentives needed for these financiers to give money to these Sunrise Industries. Looking more specifically at the securitization market, and looking less at bonds and equities and traditional investments, we see that the market opportunity is particularly promising for financial centers like Hong Kong. Figure 35B shows the size of different asset and liability securitizations in the U.S. And what we see is that some financial products like auto loans, credit cards, and even student debt are well served by asset-based securitization. Whereas in a sunrise industry like the photovoltaic industry is very poorly served by solar company asset-backed securitization. Thus, what U.S. financiers fail to do, Hong Kong financiers might be able to insert themselves in this financial intermediation chain. Yet, current prospects for Hong Kong do not look promising. Figure 35C shows the extent of securitization in various jurisdictions, and what we see is that for equity securitizations, some jurisdictions like the U.S. and Switzerland absolutely dominate other jurisdictions like Hong Kong and Japan, yet there's a special link between Germany and China, which we note throughout our entire report, and we see that special relationship coming out in these figures with German companies dominating the market for these securitized transactions in these solar companies, in equity securitizations in general. Moreover, not only is there a market opportunity for such solar investment in terms of the financial side of the business, but we also see that even on the production side of the business, that this type of financing might actually contribute to reducing costs. Figure 36 shows the costs of creating electricity if these solar panels are financed in various ways. Thus, looking at the residential solar segment of this market, we see that electricity costs potentially fall the most for when companies are financed by debt. Costs are the highest when these solar companies issue equity. And even at the utility scale, which we talked about previously, electricity costs are certainly lower, concomitant with economies of scale, yet we see broadly the same pattern holding, such that debt has helped to lower electricity costs much more than other types of finance. Continuing along this line, we see in figure 35A that there's been, unsurprisingly, a global collapse in the securitization business. The figure shows the issuances of these securities, particularly asset-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and asset-backed commercial paper. And what we see, of course, is that these markets developed very quickly before the financial crisis and shrank very quickly after the financial crisis. Of course, all financial centers abuse these types of securities, but nevertheless, one has to admit that if you believe our story about different types of finance helping to facilitate the production and consumption of solar energy, 
then there's a very large market opportunity for financial centers like Hong Kong. Yet we see that financial centers like Hong Kong are not currently positioned to take advantage of these opportunities, given that, that their securitization business historically has not focused on assets, but rather on gambling. Remember we talked previously about the value of an international financial center as focusing on the real economy, on the real growth of a sunrise industry, rather than focusing on bank costs, bank procedures, and so forth. Yet what we see after the financial crisis is that most of the proposed reforms in Hong Kong focus exactly on these financial intermediaries rather than focusing on ways of helping investors manage these risks and returns. For example, in Figure 41, we see rules coming out of the Securities and Futures Commission, which focuses on the types of disclosures that have to be made and other requirements for these financial industries, yet we don't see the types of rules that are needed by investors and intermediaries to really understand this industry, to figure out what are the returns, what are the risks, and provide money accordingly. And what we see is that even before the financial crisis, that this so-called securitization actually didn't securitize any tangible thing, but simply focused on linking these securities to the success of different companies like Lehman Brothers. This figure shows the value of investments in various types of Lehman Brothers products sold in Hong Kong. And we see the highest level of demand for products like mini bonds, which later became very controversial in Hong Kong. Yet we see large amounts of demand for other securitized products, particularly in relation to equity-linked investments, where these equities absolutely did not always relate to an actual tangible asset. So the lesson from this figure is that not only is there the potential of significant market demand in a financial center like Hong Kong, but that the market was so distorted by the design of the securitization industry to focus all this money more on linked notes rather than on actually letting people hold papers that gave them ownership of solar panels. To provide proof for our assertion that many of these securitized products were simply gambling rather than productive investments, Figure 39 shows the marketing literature for the most predominant form of security at that time, mini bonds. Advertising materials given to investors focus not on solar panels or offices or cars or anything tangible, but these institutional intermediaries would instead offer bottles of wine, even though investments had nothing to do with viticulture. They would offer free electronics, which of course have nothing to do with a investor's risk appetite or desire for returns. And looking at this so-called plain English language disclosure, we see that in fact what investors were taking on is what economists call a contingent state of the world based pricing scheme. In other words, Investors would be paid off if companies linked to that note did not go bankrupt, but they would lose money if those companies actually went bankrupt. And in many cases, what we see is that the underlying security for those notes was never even really identified. Thus, we see on the marketing side that there's no identification of what the investor needs, and we see on the product side no identification of something tangible that actual consumers need. And for those of you that are interested in the companies that were linked to these notes, Figure 40B shows the number of series linked to various companies, namely linked to bets that various companies would not go bankrupt. Naturally, the largest amount of demand seemed to center around the bankruptcy of Standard Charter, HSBC, Citigroup. These are financial institutions. So financial institutions were selling bets on themselves not going bankrupt. 
Furthermore, there's other evidence showing how previous practices did not look at the result of such finance, but simply at the procedures of providing that finance itself. Figure 42, for example, shows the way that some structured product investment materials were encouraged to be written in plain English, but even after going through all these instruments from issuers like DBS Bank, China Construction Bank, and so forth, we see that the information and structure of their disclosure materials provided everything except basically what they were investing in. We know what the product was in terms of the thing that the end investor would be holding, but these documents did not provide significant information on the actual things that the money was going to be used for. For example, the solar companies or the pizza makers or the taxi companies. Because investors had no way of knowing which Sunrise or Sunset Industries they were investing in, they were basically taking on bets Las Vegas or Macau style. Indeed, from figure 43b, we see that Hong Kong's financial center market is not even geared to provide one of the most important aspects of a financial center, namely information about these investment products. We rank the quality of information about different solar companies in the US relative to Hong Kong. And what we see is that the depth and the value of information given in the US is far superior to that in Hong Kong. Hong Kong listed solar companies don't provide the same kinds of webcasts that their US listed peers provide. They don't provide the same kind of deep and detailed information in investment disclosures. And Hong Kong brokers absolutely do not provide the types of analyses on these solar companies that their US peers do. Thus, it's obvious that as a financial center, Hong Kong positions itself as focusing more on returns and not worrying about where those returns come from, rather than helping investors really understand the nuts and bolts of what they're putting their money into. Indeed, we might assert that IFC would not stand for International Financial Center, but might instead stand for Informational Financial Center. The value of a financial center is the quality and depth of information that it provides to both sides of this financing market namely information to the solar companies about where to get money and information to investors about where to find potential opportunities in these sunrise industries. Yet, in the case of Hong Kong, we see that even government-sponsored information intermediaries focus far more on their own internal formats and procedures rather than thinking about their customers. In the figure you see before you, we see basically one of the only places an investor can go for more information about different types of securities. Just by looking quickly at the layout, it's not very friendly at all compared to examples we show from the US. And it's clear that the user of this website and this information is the government, namely looking like they're giving information rather than targeting the people that will actually be using this information. Moreover, we see that if the US has taken aggressive measures to become an informational financial center, then Hong Kong lags very much behind. Very quickly on the heels of the international financial crisis, we see that lawmakers in the U.S. propose numerous provisions aimed at increasing information, particularly related to these securitized markets. We show in this figure different provisions focused on providing information, such as asset level information, disclosures of company ratings, computer readable loan level information, and so forth. And we also provide a brief description of each of these provisions. And it's clear that one of the broad approaches in the US market was to increase the volume of information not only making investment in securitized products safer, but also deeper. It's therefore of little surprise that places like New York and Chicago dominate investment in China's solar industry rather than Hong Kong. Let's look at another aspect of this information production, namely court cases related to some of these solar companies. One of the best ways of obtaining information about companies is not when everything is going well, but when there are conflicts or when something isn't going as well in a company. And what we see is that if investors have significant recourse in the US, 
namely if U.S.-based investors are able to take companies to court, get information, and seek redress from their investments, then there's very few similar cases in Hong Kong. Thus, simply by looking at the weight of these cases, the number of these cases, we might suppose that Hong Kong-based investors would feel much less certain about their investment in Hong Kong-listed securities relative to U.S.-listed ones. Looking at more depth at an IFC as an informational financial center, we talk in the paper about the example of Jim Cramer and his show Mad Money. Now, naturally, his style may not appeal to certain types of watchers, but it's nevertheless true that this show and shows like it provide far more information about certain types of companies than anything available, certainly in the English language, in financial centers like Hong Kong. We see that the amount of discussion about solar companies may not necessarily differ from one financial center to the other. It's not simply the amount of information that's discussed, it's the depth of that information. Thus, looking at figure 43A, simply looking at citations of the companies you see in front of you, we see that for companies listed in the U.S. relative to Hong Kong, there doesn't seem to be any informational advantage in either jurisdiction. That's good news for Hong Kong in that Hong Kong doesn't seem to be lagging too far behind the U.S. in terms of providing information about these industries, yet it also does not show that Hong Kong is not very proactive about providing such information either. To further bolster the case, we show English language internet resources for traders from different jurisdictions, and what we see is that the proportion of foreign visitors in a resource like Seeking Alpha hovers at around 33%, certainly 53% in the case of Bloomberg, and even in the UK case, we see that investors interested in obtaining information from centers like Full UK, Financial Times, we see that foreign visitors comprise roughly 42% and even 82% of each of these information centers respectively. Yet, looking at one of the only sources of information I could find in the English language about Hong Kong equities, namely AA stocks, we see that they have a proportion of foreign visitors of only 22%, of which mainland Chinese readers comprise the bulk. Only 7% of AA stocks visitors come from the US. Contrast this with the case in the UK of 36%, 34%. While it's true that Hong Kong may not be a English-only or necessarily even a bilingual jurisdiction, it's nevertheless true that English is the international language of investment and commerce, and if Hong Kong hopes to provide an informational advantage as part of its informational financial center, it will need to provide more resources in the English language. We come to perhaps the most important part of this presentation, namely what to do about some of these trends. How can an international financial center like Hong Kong compete against deeper and more profitable centers like New York and London? We show proposals for regulatory reforms at several levels. Looking at our figure A4 in the paper, we show the financial secretary's instructions to Hong Kong's central bank as a banking regulator and its Securities and Futures Commission as the regulator for broker-dealers. And what we argue is that Hong Kong should adopt regulations similar to those that the U.S. has already adopted in its Crowdfund Act. Namely, after the financial crisis, the U.S. aggressively targeted small companies that needed to attract funding from diversified investors, and their approach was to make information markets as rich and as deep as possible. And Figure 51 shows some of the major provisions of that U.S. crowd fund. The way to implement these provisions in the Hong Kong context would consist of a financial secretary's instruction. Namely, the financial secretary is the executive power that oversees both the monetary authority and the securities regulator. 
Thus, such an instruction could very easily define something like an emerging growth company, coinciding with the seven sectors defined in the mainland's 12th five-year plan, which hopefully naturally corresponds to these sunrise industries. Intermediaries, even funded by the government, could promote bond and asset-backed securities web portals, like we've shown in our previous slides. Naturally, web portals which encourage or require electronic submission of all asset and other data in a machine-readable format. We might even encourage the securities regulator to issue a rule book about investment in these sunrise industries, which include certain types of exemptions for investors who have plenty of information that want to use funding platforms, online platforms, in order to channel money into solar panels, concrete things, rather than bets on companies going bankrupt. And what we argue in this specific case is that the Financial Services Development Council, the body instructed to promote the financial industry in Hong Kong, we argue that, that it's up to them to create not only the draft of this regulation, but also to fund and get profits from the provision of things like these web portals. Looking more specifically at this Sunrise Industries Code, which might be adopted by the securities regulator, the code roughly follows similar provisions in the U.S. Most importantly, it changes the way that Hong Kong currently treats exchanges and crowdfunding portals. As you probably know, crowdfunding is very much discouraged at present by Hong Kong regulations, and such regulations probably give the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and its parent company a huge advantage over potential rivals. Most important to this regulatory process will be the way that it helps encourage infomediaries rather than simple intermediaries. So regulation should help build up the stock of information and specifically information about the specific intangible assets that these securities invest in. Thus, it's up to financial law in order to facilitate an international financial center like Hong Kong capture assets in these sunrise industries. This has been another Infographic Instant conference presentation with Brian Michael.